Beyblade V-Force, the second ever Beyblade series, was a season all about cheating. The bad guys want to cheat with cyber bit beasts. The good guys want to cheat with illegal mods to their Beyblades. So where does cheating get you in the world of Beyblade? You'll have to keep watching this retrospective review to find out. It's no secret that in my 2024 Beyblade rewatch, I was blown away by the storytelling of season one, but unimpressed with the first 16 episodes of Beyblade V-Force. I did feel things were starting to get good around episode 15 of V-Force with this solid Hillary episode and a tragedy involving Kai's classmate in episode 16. So covering episode 17 to 33, it's time to find out if 15 and 16 were rare gems in an otherwise boring season, or a signal that V-Force was about to get good. Welcome back to the Did You Know? This is part two of the Beyblade V-Force review. If you find you enjoy nostalgic deep dives like this, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future reviews of Beyblade, Digimon, Beatamon, Dragon Ball Daima, and more. Following Wyatt's failure to pilot Cyber Dronzer, which is in fact his death in the original Japanese version, Gideon and Dr. B are already looking for a new blader candidate. The blade breakers are starting to crack under the pressure of the cyber bit beasts, the saint shield attacks, and they temporarily disband until Hillary throws a team building barbecue. Down by the river, a group of four new bladers introduce themselves. They're new around here, but their voices aren't. The girl in the group, Salima, is Oliver from the Majestics, and Kane, their leader, is Lee's voice actor. I kind of like hearing the actors behind iconic season one characters return in V-Force even when their characters sit out of the season. It doesn't take long for the audience to learn that the four new bladers, Kane, Goki, Jim, and Salima are the latest test pilots for the Cyber Bit Beasts. Dr. B barges into Dickinson's office to set up yet another match between the Blade Breakers and the newest psychics. Dickinson refuses, but Dr. B threatens to destroy the city using Cyber Bit Beasts if the Blade Breakers refuse. Dickinson goes, you're bluffing, and Dr. B says, can you take the risk? I like the idea that he could be lying, but we don't get to find out because the Blade Breakers do accept. Tyson is disturbed that his new buddy Kane would be working for Team Psychic, even though they spent no more than two minutes blading together down by the river, Tyson thinks he knows Kane inside out and he refuses to believe Kane is the type of guy to work for Gideon and Dr. B. Aware of the cyber bit beast power, Tyson is willing to do whatever it takes to win and has Kenny and Dizzy mod his blade to the point that it would not be considered tournament legal? Tyson has this freakish dragoon, it's the Skull Greymon moment for Beyblade, with Tyson saying, quote, if you want to stay competitive, you gotta do whatever it takes. Considering we all knew a kid who showed up to school with some sketchy spark disc or a giant Beyblade acquired from a flea market, I kind of like that modded, illegal Beyblades have actually made their way into the story of V-Force. It's art imitating life, it's Bay imitating Blade. The rest of the Blade Breakers are pretty disgusted by Tyson's tunnel vision and willingness to cheat. Hillary says, I hope you realize cheaters are just big losers. Ray is especially sickened by Tyson's tactics and goes on this soul-searching walk through town where he runs into Salima, who herself is uncomfortable with her teammates getting an unfair boost via their cyber bit beasts. In that same episode, Ozuma beats Tyson even with with the Blade Breaker using his freakish Beyblade, helping him understand that it'll take more than a modded Beyblade to beat Team Psychic. In 21, the gang make their way to the battle tower for this showdown. Despite being invited, the team is swarmed by Blade Bruiser bots with Mecha Shooters. The Saint Shield gang appear and offer to take on the Mecha Shooters for the Blade Breakers, allowing our crew to climb the battle tower and focus on their one-on-one -on -one matches. The first of these four matches is Max versus Jim, the Battle of Drusils. My biggest takeaway from episodes 21 and 22 have to do with the English production, specifically the voice acting. These episodes are where it became real clear to me that Max's voice actor was going through puberty. His voice is deeper and more unstable. Sometimes in voice acting, this could be an issue for child actors, but here in Beyblade, it kind of works. It has been a year in the world of Beyblade, after all, since we first met Max in episode three of series one, so it stands to reason that this teenager is growing up. The animation in this episode is very gorgeous. It's V-Force's best looking episode with really cool shots of Max, very artistic framing, the kind of shadow and lighting work you see on like feature film versions of animated shows. Ultimately, by cheating via infinite healing, Jim bests Max and Drusil is absorbed by a machine taken away from his blader. The second match is Ray versus Salima featuring Drigger and Cyber Drigger. Salima is upset that Ray isn't giving it his all, which is kind of a copy paste of the Ray versus Mariah match from series one. Eventually, both bladers kick it up. Jim goes, they're too evenly matched. And Dr. B responds, well, that's why we cheat before deploying these ridiculous wind machines to throw Ray off his game. Salima determines she doesn't want to win through cheating and commands Cyber Drigger to destroy those fans. She confesses to Ray some regret over how she acquired her new power, how she and Kane just wanted to get stronger. Ray accepts the sincere apology and ultimately defeats her. 24 is the Battle of the Dronzers, with Kai facing off against Goki. But this is really the end cap to Kai's very strong Wyatt plot, and it's really Kai versus Kai. 
Kai. Seconds into the match, he's troubled by visions of Wyatt, Kai's brain convincing him it's Wyatt, not Goki, on the other side of the stadium. Again, this hits way harder knowing that Wyatt actually didn't survive in the original Japanese version of the show. Tyson is actually the one to help Kai snap out of it, telling him, quote, you're not fighting against Wyatt, you're fighting for him. Kai gets it together and says, watch me, Wyatt, watch me Beyblade for you. Again, a far stronger beat when you know what really happened to Kai's classmate. The Kai and Wyatt stuff really is the best characterization V-Force has offered any of the characters. One small note that had me laughing, after Kai wins, he goes, Wyatt, I got my revenge for you. I just think revenge is probably the wrong choice of word here. Justice or I avenged you probably would have worked better. Revenge is very intense, but then again, it's Kai and Kai is very intense. Then it's time for the final matchup, Tyson vs. Kane, starting with episode 25 titled Raising Kane, a strange pun based on an American chicken finger fast food restaurant. Kane is lost in the sauce, totally a tool for Gideon and the higher ups. When Tyson says you're just being used like another piece of equipment, it gets Kane to snap. He screams, quote, I'm not a machine, I'm a human being, and opts to not release Cyber Dragoon onto the battlefield. He wants to prove he can beat Tyson fairly without the Cyber Bit Beast bestowed to him by Dr. B. It's cool, it's noble, but Dr. B has an override function for the Cyber Bit Beast and is able to manually trigger Cyber Dragoon remotely. Tyson and Dragoon ultimately destroy Cyber Dragoon, taking the entire facility down too. The building is about to blow and the kids evacuate, minus Tyson and Max who still need to reclaim Drasil. They find Drasil's aura contained in a giant test tube and it's actually the Saint Shields who free Max's beast by shattering the tube with their four Beyblades. It's a nice beat, though there's no reason to believe Tyson and Max couldn't have shattered the glass with their blades. Still a nice gesture by the Saint Shields who ultimately don't want the bit beast going to the men in suits. All of the kids from the Blade Breakers, the Saint Shields, and Team Psychic make it out of the building. Kane and Salima apologize to Tyson and the gang, saying they realize now that there's a big difference between wanting something and earning it, and that moving forward, they're done with shortcuts. In series one, every individual arc had a moral that it taught to and through one of the Blade Breakers. In V-Force, it seems that the kind of series-wide moral is cheating is for losers. From the Team Psychic's boosting with Cyber Bit Beast, to Tyson stooping so low as to build a freak blade with illegal parts, there's no stronger message for viewers to take away other than, yo, don't cheat. It's not a bad lesson, just a bit funny for a game of spinning tops that in real life is incredibly luck based. But again, I'm not going to object to or criticize a children's show for teaching that taking shortcuts is not the way to go through life. So now we're at the halfway point in V-Force. Team Psychic and the Cyber Bit Beast shenanigans are behind us, and arguably the story kind of starts now. In 28, we abruptly learn that the Blade Breakers are headed to New York City. We learn that Judy's team is in possession of a strange stone discovered in a Mexican desert, and they believe the writing dates back to a civilization that lived before the ancient Inca. Importantly, given this is Beyblade, there are bit beasts inside the rock. Apparently, the ones housed within this rock are the oldest sacred spirits the scientists are aware of. In New York, Max gets his own friend for V-Force. Kai got Wyatt, Ray connected with Salima, Tyson had a nice thing with Kane, but now Max gets Alan. He's a kid from Max's childhood, the Riku to his Sora, and he's a test blader at Judy's laboratory. He also loves burgers, hell yeah, and sometimes looks exactly like Hiro Amanokawa from Digimon Ghost Game. I know that's random, but I covered that series weekly, so I just had to call that out. There's an overnight break-in at the lab, and the ancient rock is stolen. It turns out it was an inside job, and that none other than Alan helped the thieves secure the rock. In 29, in order to get close to Alan to get a proper explanation for his misdeeds, Max enters a tournament in Brooklyn he knows Alan will be playing in. I like that the English dub specifically calls out Brooklyn instead of just bunching all of New York together into one undefined super city. Alan's playing with a blade provided to him by the crime organization he worked with, and he's told there's an ultra powerful bit beast inside just waiting for him to use it. But when it comes time to battle Max, no bit beast appears in Alan's impulse blade. He got duped, and now the FBI is here to arrest him. Although Max's mom and dad interfere with the investigation, blocking the federal agent from entering the arena, at least until Max and Alan can complete their spinning tops game. Upon losing, Alan does apologize for stealing, and maybe gets arrested? He's taken away by that agent. But before that, he does explain himself to Max, saying, quote, it was greed, plain and simple. So another story about cheating and taking shortcuts here for V-Force. In episode 30, we're back in Japan along with Judy, and we finally learn about Dr. Zagart, the mystery man above even Gideon. As it turns out, 30 years ago, he and Mr. Dickinson were research partners studying the power of gyroscopes and spinning tops. Back then, they had their own mysterious rock, like the one in New York. They experimented on it, and a primitive bit beast showed itself to Dickinson and Zagart. Dickinson says, quote, We had no idea what Pandora's box we were opening. Shortly thereafter, Zagart and the rock vanished, and for 30 years, Dickinson never heard from him again. It appears after the failure of the Cyber Bit Beast, Zagart's new plan for controlling ultra-powerful Bit Beasts is to extract the primal beast trapped inside the stone. It's solid exposition, not bad for a filler season, nothing here explicitly contradicts
contradicts any lore from series 1, at least not that I can recall. In the back half of episode 30, we meet who will be one of the most important players in V-Force Endgame, Zeo. Tyson is back by the river in a 4v1 against Saint Shield when Zeo shows up to save him. This character intro though, it's not dissimilar to Kane and the other psychics entry scene just a few episodes ago, which in itself was not the first time a new character debuted by the river. V-Force was already remixing series 1 ideas, but now it's full on repeating itself. Tyson just can't stop meeting frenemies down by this river. Things kind of stall out in episodes 31 and 32 before a great lore filled episode 33. In 31 we learn Zeo goes to a Beyblading gym and he's super insistent on bringing Tyson around to show his gym buddies that he knows a world champion blader. It's kind of giving clout chaser energy, Tyson even recognizes it. The other noteworthy beat in this episode is when Kenny reveals the Bit Searcher, used for tracing the energy of Bit Beast. I had never seen this thing in real life, but sure enough, like the Beyblade Battle Analyzer, this was a real toy in Japan, the Bit Finder. Those who know more about this stuff describe it as a Digivice slash Tamagotchi equivalent, but with Bit Beast, so that's cool I guess, kind of a collector's item. There's something funny to me about V4 serving as a glorified toy commercial, when a bunch of the products it's advertising weren't even available to the audience watching. In 32, the Saint Shields declare that now, in episode 32, the time has come to take the Blade Breaker's Bit Beast. Like for real, no more stalling, it's actually happening now. I have no idea why it took 32 episodes of them saying this week over week, but as we'll see in 33, there's finally some real progress on that front. In 33, Dickinson comes up with a translation for the writing carved into the mysterious rocks. It says, dare not disturb this stone, for here the Bit Beasts are sealed. And it turns out the Saint Shield's ancestors are the ones who did the sealing. Ozuma monologues, quote, 10,000 years ago the sacred spirits were the source of all blessings on this planet. Life on earth was paradise and humankind wanted for nothing. Evil people sought to control them for their own power. The Saint Shield's ancestors worked to seal away the Bit Beasts so that nobody could misuse them. And in response, an evil brotherhood who was mishandling the Bit Beasts' power employed the four strongest spirits to get their revenge. Those were the Black Turtle of Water, the White Tiger of Gold, the Red Phoenix of Fire, and the Blue Dragon of Wind. In other words, the Blade Breaker's Bit Beasts. These four spirits did battle with Ozuma's ancestors, but the four mysteriously vanished, never to be seen again until reappearing publicly in Beyblade Series 1. I'm oddly impressed with this lore dump, giving us the proper Saint Shield origin while also exploring the history of our main four Bit Beasts. I like that it paints them as tools used for evil, though it's not so black and white. It's not like these Bit Beasts are objectively evil spirits, at least we don't know that yet, but that evil people used them. Their power is unquestionable though, and we finally understand why the Saint Shield want them and want to seal them away. It's especially understandable when evil people like Gideon, Dr. B, and Zagard are around and are actively trying to gain control of them. Sure, maybe Tyson and the boys are good-natured, but they're children who are constantly losing their bit beasts. Tyson tells Ozuma, we don't care what our bit beasts were a thousand years ago, all that matters now is that they're our friends. Dunga and Rei go head to head, and although there's no real reason given to why Dunga is suddenly so much better, it's a blowout and Rei is defeated, Drigger is taken, and off-site the Saint Shields perform a sort of sealing ritual to imprison Drigger in the rock. And that's where I'm choosing to end part two of my V-Force review. The Kane and Salima psychic stuff is complete, the trip to New York is behind us, the introduction of Zeo, Zagart, and the ancient origins of the Saint Shields are finally explained. I never thought I'd say this, but the series is definitely going somewhere, and I think I like the direction. We've got a very compelling origin story for the four main bit beasts, their ancient weapons of mass destruction. Now there is this conundrum going into the final batch of episodes where, as an audience, we have to admit that, yeah, maybe a handful of children aren't qualified to carry around these super weapons when nefarious adults are constantly attempting to steal them, and the option to seal them away entirely is sitting right there. Emotional MVP of this batch, the award has to go to Kai for the Wyatt stuff that wrapped up in episode 24. Comedic MVP, I don't recall any real belly laughs in this string of episode, but I'll give it to Dr. B for the time Jim said Ray and Salima are too evenly matched, and Dr. B said, well, that's why we cheat. Done Dirty Award goes to Ray for how easily they made him lose to Dunga so as to advance the plot. It just wasn't right. So V-Force, again, on average, I don't think it ever reaches the highs of Series 1 Beyblade. However, it gets better with every story beat. Its single moral, that cheating is for losers, is well-meaning but one note, and I'd like to see more development for the core characters. Though again, I recognize the Blade Breakers had their narrative journeys in the first season, but hopefully the show takes advantage of characters like Zeo, Ozuma, even Kenny and Hillary in its final batch of episodes, as they have potential for solid story arcs. Of course, let me know what you thought about this middle section of Beyblade V-Force. Do you remember it vividly? Did it all come back to you through this video? Subscribe to the channel if you haven't so you don't miss part 3 of my V-Force retrospective review and future videos on not just Beyblade but Digimon, Beatamon, Dragon Ball Daima, and more. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.